Hello and welcome to Miss Town Loves Grammar. In this video we'll be concentrating on the theme of social class in the Spectacles Calls by J.B. Priestley. So Priestley pushes the audience into the home of a wealthy family and their prejudices and ignorance towards the lower class are the focus of the whole play. As a socialist, Priestley was definitely interested in the class system and how it influenced the judgments that people make and the kinds of ways they perhaps are guided by capitalism and the belief that we are only as worthy as the amount of money we make. Only Edna the Maid is an example of a lower class character that we meet and perhaps this accentuates the difference between upper and lower class characters quite significantly. She's paid to be there and she's very much the minor character. However, the narrative of the lower class is conveyed through the tragic tale of Eva Smith or Daisy Renton and we learn of how each character treated her and ultimately how their attitudes, because of their class, coloured their judgments towards her in her hour of need. By the end of this play, we are aware that there are hundreds of thousands of John and Eva Smiths. The inspector is defender of the lower class and stirs the family and Gerald into hearing that they are each responsible for Eva's death. As the curtain falls at the end of this play, there is a bittersweet tension. The older generation show no remorse and cling to their privilege, whilst the younger generation are truly traumatised. So let's go through some key quotes and consider their significance, act by act. So, Arthur, you're not supposed to say such things, says Mrs Burling in Act 1. She's described by Priestley in the stage directions as a rather cold woman her husband's social superior, and she demonstrates in her interactions with her husband that she understands etiquette perhaps better than he does. When she says you're not supposed to, she seems much more boisterous than you might expect a woman in patriarchal 1912 Edwardian society should be. She is, after all, correcting her husband. Perhaps it reflects a hint of her knowing she is her own husband's social superior, as we already gleaned from the stage directions from Priestley himself. I wonder if Priestley is showing this interaction to irk us, that means annoy us as the audience into being frustrated by small-minded rules, or is it actually to remind us of the constraints of the class system that's in operation? When she says, now Arthur, I don't think you ought to talk business on this occasion. This additional reference in the same act restates that the priority is meant to be celebrating the very socially acceptable uh, union between Gerald to their daughter Sheila. To some extent, you could argue that Gerald is a social superior. He is, after all, uh, part of the Croft Limited family and company. It's once more reminding us, through this evidence anyway, that her husband needs reminding of social rules and etiquette and that he's clearly so obsessed about being a hard-headed businessman that he often loves to talk business which is not a done thing amongst the upper classes in society you don't want to talk shop you want to sound much more civilized it's ironic that so much effort is taken to be seen matching the conforms of like what upper class dinner parties should be not the basic standards of fairness that should be met when Eva arrives into our narrative. And when we learn of how Mrs Burling treats her in Act 2, we are shocked that this small-minded woman is obsessed instead with when one should talk about something or how one should say something. Priestley is pointedly critiquing the priorities that Mrs Burling has as focusing too much on how others in her class might see her and them as a family. Mr Burling is shown to be relentless in discussing work and definitely explains his work ethic of success. So when Mr Burling says, if you don't come down sharply on some of these people, they'd soon be asking the earth. He's asserting his business stance here and the adverb sharply reflects his tough belief on how you should manage employees. It's almost shared as if it's advice. The generic term, these people, mirrors the language his wife uses in Act 2 when she says, girls of that class. It reflects once more a very dismissive and damaging attitude to those who are impoverished and vulnerable. There's some rather deep-rooted exaggeration of 
soon be asking for the earth. It's definitely reflecting his rather callous views and what he believes makes him hard-headed because he believes that his employees are almost scroungers with unreasonable demands. Asking for the earth suggests almost that he believes he's playing God also because you could only really ask the earth of something that was divine. Is Priestley questioning here the fundamental principles of capitalism through Mr Burling? Or is he simply undermining his scruples, that means Mr Burling's scruples to be honest, as advice to those at the dinner table, because he's such a wise man after all? It's important that when we meet the inspector in Act 1, he immediately cuts to any nonsense that he should be intimidated by Mr Burling, who narrates that he plays golf with the inspector's superiors. The inspector says, I don't play golf. He's not up for that. He doesn't need to be swayed. So he says instead this line, which accentuates how much he has little respect for how this social class have behaved. So you use the power you had as a daughter of a good customer and also a man well known in the town to punish this girl. So the inspector is used as the voice of reason here to shed light on the abuses committed against Eva. He's talking to both Sheila, of course, and Mr Burling. Sheila as a daughter of a good customer and Mr Burling as a man well known in town highlights their status playing every bit of a part in how they choose to behave. The verb punish is brutal and it reflects how Ghoul's interrogation and investigation is not glossing over anything. He expects each, countable, each character sorry, to be accountable for how they're behaving. And Priestley uses this response from the inspector to bluntly recount the events and the cost paid by Eva Smith at their hands. So now in Act 2, when Mrs Burling says, yes, I think it was simply a piece of gross impertinence, that was one of the things that prejudiced me against her. The phrase gross impertinence highlights her rage at her name being used. After all, whether it's Eva or Daisy at this stage in the play, they refer to themselves as Mrs Burling in order to get some money to look after their unborn child. Now it's ironic the whole point of this charity that Mrs Burling is meant to be a part of is to support the vulnerable. Yet here she is admitting that she was prejudiced against her case. Now I've truncated the quote here. She says she was quite naturally prejudiced against her. It's a disgraceful attitude to have. And Priestley is heightening here the dangerous power that can be wielded by men and women actually in upwardly mobile social circles who have power because they have money to decide the fate of the vulnerable. Perhaps a post-war audience who's watching this would be forced to question how could they help the vulnerable better? After all, Priestley is writing this at the advent of the NHS that is formed in 1947. And perhaps this is a way of him putting forward the dangers of what happens when socialist ideals are not prevalent in the way people behave. Finally, didn't I say I couldn't imagine a real inspector talking like that to us? When Mrs Burling says that in Act 3, she is revelling in being right. The question, didn't I say, is more focused on being right than it is about learning an actual lesson from the inspector. She is obsessed and fixated on the way Ghoul interrogated them. It's as if the social class shields them from being probed, because she couldn't imagine a real inspector talking to her like that. Shocking, but scary, because it amplifies further the unease we should feel towards the lack of remorse, remorse sorry, that she shows, and the power of that class system that allows the wealthy to get away with more than they should. So Priestley here is positioning at the end of the play a very uncomfortable realisation that's chilling for the audience. In a theatre in post-war Britain, we've probably got a largely middle class or upper middle class audience. And they are realising they should change any pre-war attitudes they may have had to create a climate that needs to be a more equal society. Social class is everything in this play.
But more than anything, it's everything about the power between those who have control and those like Eva who don't. Socialist Priestley is determined for characters to show the audience that this should not be repeated in post-war Britain and definitely is food for thought for anyone reflecting on the power of this play. Why not subscribe to Miss Hannah Loves Grammar for all things English, literary and grammatical?